we were sitting there fishing and uh, I heard a noise and turned around and looked and seen some blue lights, some hazy blue lights. And that's when, you know, the craft landed behind us. We still wasn't for sure what it was, but it landed and we turned around and the front of it opened up. And when it did, it was just like we were paralyzed there for, he couldn't move and I couldn't move. But there's three uh, robot looking creatures that floated out. They didn't walk, they just kind of glided out of the craft and come over and two got a hold of uh, me and one got a hold of Charlie and they took us inside. They did an examination. So when they examined us, we was probably in there, I'm going to say 45 minutes, I'm not real sure. I didn't have a watch or nothing at the time. They put us back out at the same place we were, facing the water, and I was froze, you know, in one spot. And originally, I didn't want to talk about it no more, so Charlie just said, you know, play like you passed out in there and you won't have to say nothing too much. So that's what I did. I kind of went along with that. When it took off, it didn't make hardly any noise at all. You just heard like a zipping noise. It was zip, and that was it, and it was gone. And it shattered the windows in my car. I had a brand-new 1973 Horner Rambler. Took them down there and put them in a room with a... With a voice-activated mic, and it's in the, hidden in the desk to see what they'd say. Well, we, me and the other investigator got up and left to let them talk to see if they were going to say, well, we got them fooled and all. They didn't. They, they were really concerned. The boys kept telling Charles to don't talk to them, and people's going to come back and get us. I did go on a few talk shows at the beginning of this, thinking that it would uh, settle down after that. These people even up till today that's still trying to track me down. A former cop has put together hundreds of case files regarding clusters of missing persons in national parks where the circumstances are flat out strange, but don't expect any answers from the Park Service. At the end of the night, I was staying in a, a motel off the government or off the Park Service land. They get a knock on the door. The person who confided in law enforcement veteran David Politis was a government employee who told one heck of a story about people who vanish in national parks, places like Yosemite, but also national forests, including the Toyabe, west of Las Vegas. In the years since the knock at the door, Politis has scoured small town newspaper archives and pestered federal agencies for records. He found so many cases of missing people that a planned book became two, filled with more than 400 cases of people who went into national parks but never came out. People disappear in the wilds all the time, and we're talking about something different. These were unusual things that don't make sense that happened to cluster together cluster together in three to four, sometimes as many as 20, 30 
people missing at one location. The individual cases are strange enough, Politis says, but stranger still were the reactions of federal agencies when he asked for public records. And when we FOIA'd them, we got a response back that they don't keep any lists of missing people. The response was not only no, but hell no, he says. So he began putting his own list together and discovered what appears to be nearly 30 clusters of disappearances in national parks and forests, cases which meet a narrow set of odd characteristics. The people who vanish often do so right under the noses of others, in many cases of kids, their parents' noses. Being parents, and being responsible people, we understand there's no way my son or daughter wouldn't know the way back from being just down the road getting the ball. But it happens all the time. It happens all the time. The missing defy logic. They hike uphill, for instance, often steep climbs. Children as young as two or three are found a day or two later many miles away and over mountain ranges. Some kids are found in phenomenal distances away that would make no logical sense to any parent. Weird things happen to their clothing. The missing often shed their clothes right away, even in bad weather. Clothes are found sometimes neatly folded, but not the people. The ranger described to me, if you were standing straight up and you just had your shirt, or just had your pants on, and you melted directly into your pants, that's what it looked like to him. The pants were laying on the ground in a very neat pile. The missing defy normal search and rescue practices. Bodies are found in places that are all but inaccessible, or they're found in the open, in areas that were repeatedly searched earlier. Bloodhounds or other tracker dogs are often befuddled. If the dog can't find a scent, that's a red flag. If a dog, a canine dog, a trained dog, is put on the scent at the point last seen, and it lays down and it doesn't want to track anymore, red flag. And that happens more than you think. Nevada doesn't have a major cluster, but it has plenty of cases. Children who vanished around Lake Tahoe, in the center of the state near Tonopah, and at Mount Charleston. In 1966, six-year-old Larry Jeffrey of Henderson disappeared while playing with his two brothers, setting off a massive 16-day search by as many as a thousand men. Former Sheriff There's Ralph Lamb remembers it clearly. Walked away from camp. Never did hear from him, never did see him, never did find him. We had hundreds of people there working, almost shoulder to shoulder. There's no large predators per se. Um, so we can't worry about mammals taking him. And he was in a fairly remote area where there's no vehicular access, so there's no car abduction. This boy just walked into oblivion. And in, a, in an age where you have aircraft up looking for the boy. You have 800 people scouring the mountain. You should be able to find him. That coupled with, if he was deceased, part of that uh, ongoing effort is bringing in cadaver dogs. The odor coming off the body, they should have found that. They didn't. Other aspects of this mystery are even more bizarre, though difficult to explain in just a couple of minutes. Example, many of the vanished who are found alive are kids, too young to speak, or kids who can't communicate because of disabilities. Some who are found alive say they can't remember what happened to them. In his books, David Politis reports on why some obvious explanations simply don't apply here, but he stops short of giving his own theory or explanation. I know you've been haunted by the case of 14-year-old uh, Stacy and uh, Aras or Aris. Can you explain? Yeah, Stacy uh, was 14 when she went on a uh, horse pack trip with her dad and seven other people in the Sunrise Meadows area up in uh, Yosemite. 
And what happened was is that uh, her dad, her and a, this group of people all got on a uh, horses and they rode for six, seven miles into the back country. They stopped at a series of small cabins and they all got out and they went in and cleaned up. Stacy cleaned up and she came out and she told her dad that she was going to go outside and take some pictures with her camera. And there was a 71-year-old man that was on the trip that was sitting on a boulder about 100 feet away. And she told her dad, hey, I'm going to go sit with this man and take pictures of the view out over this lake. Her dad and everybody there saw her go walking over to this boulder with the man, take these pictures. And she told the man that she was going to walk down the hill 100 yards to the lake and take some pictures of the lake and be right back. And everyone saw her leave the man. The man continued sitting there. They're at about nine, ten thousand 10,000 feet in elevation. She walks down this boulder field into this tree-lined area around the lake, and that was the last time she was ever seen. She never came back. And there was an absolute massive, massive search for, for the girl. She actually lived in the community next to where I lived at the time. I was living in Los Gatos, California. She lived in Saratoga. So this case was close, and it was... It bothered me a lot, and the more you hear about this, the more it's going to bother you. So the search, all they found is they found the lens cap from her camera just inside the tree line from where she walked in to the area by the lake. And I spoke to her uncle, who went to the scene and assisted in the search and said, Hey, Dave, it was comprehensive. It was intense. It went on formally for 10 days, informally for two weeks. They brought in helicopters with forward-looking infrared radar. They brought in uh, umpteen dozens and dozens of professional search and rescue people. They found nothing. He says, the only thing we found was that lens camp. There were no other tracks. There was nothing. It's like she vanished. So there was essentially nothing about that case for 25, 30 years. I made a request on it through Yosemite for the Freedom of Information Act to get a copy of the report. A special agent for the Park Service named Yu, last name Y-U, called me and asked me why I wanted the report. And I explained that we were doing some research on search and rescue, and we specifically were looking into people who disappeared at Yosemite, and we wanted to see what in the report that was there. And he said there was nothing there. And I said, well, are there any suspects? Is it a criminal case? He said, nope, it's a, it's a missing person case. I said, has anybody looked at it in the last 10 or 20 years? He says, not that I can think of. And I said, so there's no suspects. There's no work done on the case. She hasn't been found. Correct. I said, okay, well, could you send me a copy of the case? He said, nope. I said, why not? He says, because it's an open case and you'll never see it. And I said, but we've gotten dozens and dozens of missing persons cases from the Park Service. Why not this case? He goes, you'll, you'll never see it. And we got off the phone. I went to uh, the, my local congressman in Campbell. I appealed through him. His representative in Washington, D.C. went met with a representative from the Department of the Interior, and I got an answer back saying they won't release the case. The family of Stacy got a hold of me. They publicly asked for the case. It was denied. They made an appeal through the Park Service so the family could read the case. And this is this is dragged on, I think, for two or three years, and they still haven't seen the case. So what happened to Stacy? Don't really know. But according to the Freedom of Information Act, and what the law is intended to do is to give us access to information that our government has. This isn't a criminal case. There are no suspects. There's no crime that is thought to have occurred. Nobody can explain to me or that family why we can't see that case. And in order for you to know, you know, the real story behind it, you need to know what happened. And that is exactly what you're trying to accomplish here. And isn't FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, isn't that our right as taxpaying citizens to obtain without being questioned? And the amusing part about that is, is that when Obama came into office, he oh, yes. talked about a new, a new phase of openness in our government. And honestly, I'm shocked that, uh, I mean, it's typical for the Park Service to refuse us. I'm shocked that they're refusing that family. 
people have asked me if I've ever had this silence around me before. And uh, one time I was hunting with a friend who was in his 60s. And uh, we were way up in the Northern California mountains in the middle of nowhere. And a beautiful day, wind was blowing a little bit, and we're walking together, and something struck me, and I stopped and I said, Frank, you, you hear that? And, and as quiet as this phone line is, that's how quiet it was. And we looked up to the top of this Douglas fir tree a couple hundred feet up, and the tree's blowing. There's no sound in the forest. There's no squirrels. There's no leaves rustling. And he went and he sat on the other side of the tree. I sat on the near side of the tree, kind of watching each other's backs. We sat there for 30 minutes. And then all of a sudden, the sound came back. And things, I, I can't explain this, but things felt normal again. But it was an abnormal sense. He said, he goes, Dave, I've been in the woods 55 years. I've never, ever felt or seen that happen before. And he goes, I can guarantee something was going on, but I don't know what it was. So people who have followed the books and followed my interviews, I don't discount anything, and I don't point a finger at anything. That's right. Now, you've been extremely uh, professional about this whole thing. It would be very easy for you to go in one direction or another, but uh, you, don't, you will not do that. And I can tell you that we've had probably 10 term paper length responses as to what's happening here. It's staggering what, what the amount of uh, has been generated by people on this. And I think all the people are passionate. All of them are informed. And I think that we all go to that place in our mind that we know the most about. If you know the most about UFOs, maybe you go there. If there's another crypto topic, maybe you go there. And if you're a conspiracy believer and you think that the government might be taking us, if you go in that area. And you've got the, the, the satanic cult abductions as well. That's another one. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think that uh, it's hard to pin one culprit in these because they're so bad. what it was but it landed and we turned around and the front of it opened up and when it did it was just like we were paralyzed there for he couldn't move and I couldn't move but there's three uh, robot looking creatures that floated out they didn't walk they just kind of glided out of the craft and come over and two got a hold of uh, me and one got a hold of Charlie and they took us inside they did an examination, so when they examined us, we was probably in there, I'm going to say 45 minutes, I'm not real sure, I didn't have a watch or nothing at the time. They put us back out at the same place we were, facing the water, and I was froze, you know, in one spot. And originally, I didn't want to talk about it no more, so Charlie just said, you know, play like you passed out in there and you won't have to say nothing too much. So that's what I did, I kind of went along with that. When it took off, it didn't make hardly any noise at all. You just heard like a zipping. We were sitting there fishing, and uh, 
I heard a noise and turned around and looked and seen some blue lights, some hazy blue lights. And that's when, you know, the craft landed behind us. We still wasn't for sure. former cop has put together hundreds of case files regarding clusters of missing persons in national parks where the circumstances are flat out strange, but don't expect any answers from the Park Service. At the end of the night, I was staying in a, a motel off the government or off the Park Service land. I get a knock on the door. The person who confided in law enforcement veteran David Politis was a government employee who told one heck of a story about people who vanish in national parks, places like Yosemite, but also national forests, including the Toyabe, west of Las Vegas. In the years since the knock at the door, Politis has scoured small... You know, it was zip, and that was it, and it was gone. And it shattered the windows in my car. I had a brand new 1973 Horner Rambler. Took them down there and put them in a room with a with a voice activated mic and it's in, hidden in the desk to see what they'd say. Well, we, me and the other investigator got up and left to let them talk to see if they was going to say, "Well, we got them fooled and all." They didn't. They they were really concerned. The boys kept telling Charles to don't talk to them, and people's going to come back and get us. I did go on a few talk shows at the beginning of this, thinking that it was on. Settle down after that. There's people, even up till today, that's still trying to track me down. <laughs>